module three, or excuse me, module six in the third edition begins with classifying changes that occur in matter on page 207. Okay, so that's where we're starting. Third edition, module six. Second edition, module four, starting on page two. Oh, module six, 207 in the third edition, it would be page 106, excuse me, in the second edition, page 106. Now, we're going to go through this pretty rapidly and get to the fun stuff, which is towards the end of module six, third edition. The stuff we're going to go through pretty rapidly at the beginning are the things that we talked about at the end of last year, which was just a couple weeks ago, right? At the end, before we went for Christmas break, remember we had that pre casual schedule in the last week, and I did a couple of light teachings and gave you guys study halls and all that kind of stuff. Well, I'm going to go over some of that material again. So, this would be repeat if you pay attention. It might be the first time for some of you that you're hearing this because you probably may have been focused on other things. But now we're back, and this is time to hear it again. But it's going to be a little bit quicker because, we, again, we have already gone over this. So for those of you that did pay attention, this might get a little bit redundant, but I feel we need to cover it. Our objective is to get through the first part of this chapter relatively quickly so we can spend more time on the second half dealing with actual reactions and how to balance them. It's going to be real important for us in chemistry and how to balance reactions. All right. Let's just jump right in then with page 207 on, on third edition, page 106, second classifying changes that occur in matter. In the third edition, you'll see in, in blue, Second should be just bold. What a chemical change and what a physical change are. What is it when there's a chemical change? A chemical change is a change that affects the type of molecules or atoms that are in a substance. Whereas a physical change is something where the atoms or the molecules stay the same. One of the examples I like to use is a piece of paper. If I were to take a piece of paper I'll take a piece of tissue. If I take this tissue and I rip it, I've changed the matter. But I've changed it in a physical way, not in a chemical way. Because I haven't done anything to the individual atoms or molecules that make up the paper. Okay? All I've done is, in this case, if I take half of this, and I'm going to bring another change on it. It's changed. But it's changed physically. I haven't changed what makes up the paper. I've just put more space between the atoms at the very edge of this piece and the atoms at the very edge of this piece. I've put space between them. But I haven't changed them. If I were to take this and look at it under a microscope, I would see a certain organization of atoms and molecules that make up paper. If I cut it in half and I look at that under a microscope, what is it going to look like? It's going to look like the same paper. If I keep making it smaller and smaller, it's still paper. I haven't done anything to the atoms or the molecules that make up the paper. This is a physical change. Now, if I were to take part of this, if we had more space in a table, I'd probably do this for dramatic effect. Those of you thinking do a magic trick, no, I'm not. Okay. So, but if I had a lighter and I were to separate these and say, oh, physical change, if I look at both of them under my microscope, even that piece, they look the same. If I were to take this little wad here and burn it and convert it from paper into, when you burn something, what happens? Do you fuel? Plus oxygen reacts to produce ash and carbon dioxide and water. So if I were to take this wad of paper and burn it, and then look at the results of that burn under a microscope, would it look like this? It would be different. Because what happens in a chemical reaction, in the case burning is the energy being used and the, the flame is actually a result of the reaction taking place, we have a fuel and oxygen 
but we take the molecules or the atoms on the product side, and in the reaction we rearrange them so they're actually something different on the other side. We've changed the atoms and or molecules that make up whatever we're looking at. That's a chemical change. Physical change, you know, when you take salt and you pepper and you mix them together, you stir it, what do you have in there at the end of that? You have a mixture of salt and pepper. It, you haven't done anything to the salt and pepper, you just put them beside each other. You physically move them around. It's a physical change. Physical changes, relatively speaking, are easy to undo. Now, this would be quite challenging. You say, okay, make a physical change. Now let's undo the physical change. Okay, this one right here would be a little bit beyond our ability to do it well, but we could theoretically realign those together, right? Bring them back together. For a chemical change, you can't simply take the results of the reaction and bring them back together and have what you started with. When we rearrange the atoms and molecules from the reactants to form products, a chemical change requires another chemical change to undo it. A physical change only requires a physical change to undo it. So those reactions that produce physical changes are relatively easily reversible. Relatively speaking, you can go from one to the other and back. You can go back and forth in the reaction if it's only a physical change by undoing the physical change. We talked about that before we made mixtures. Let's say we took something that was um, magnetic and something that was not magnetic. We talked about those mixtures before. Remember, we mixed them all together. We could separate them out by just passing a magnet through them, and those things which are magnetized would be separated back out. If they don't react, they're just physically mixed together, we can relatively simply unmix them by using a magnet. But if we take something that's magnetic and something that's not magnetic, put them together, and cause a reaction to cause them to change into something else, the only way we can separate them is to reverse the reaction. We've got to go through another process of getting those things to react or, you know, reacting. And in reacting, to uncombine into what they started as. The idea of taking a piece of paper, tearing it, and putting it back together, though it's difficult, is much easier than <coughs> taking a piece of paper, burning it, and then simply trying to paste it back together. No matter what you paste together, it's not going to be the same thing you've created something different through the reaction. That's a chemical change. So if you move forward to page 211, that would be 109, second edition, and look at the on-your-own questions. Let's just think through each of these quickly. It says, classify each of the following changes as physical or chemical. When steam condenses into water. Okay. What is steam, chemically? It's water, its formula is H2O. So if you know that the formula for water is H2O, what's the chemical formula for steam? Okay. What's the chemical formula for liquid water? And what is the chemical formula for ice? Okay, so if I'm moving from, let's say we're taking it from steam, this is in the gas state, to water, which is our common name for H2O in the liquid state, and this frozen is ice, if we're moving from steam and we're condensing it into water, what are we doing to the molecules? Are we changing the molecules? Are we rearranging them into something else? No. All we're doing here is changing their relationship to one another, but we're not changing what they are. In steam, the molecules are far apart. In liquid, they're much closer together. And in solids, they're right next to each other vibrating. Okay? So we're changing their relationship to one another, but we're not changing what they are. And so to go from steam to water is a physical change, not a chemical change. 
All right, any question on that? Does it make sense that it's a physical change and not a chemical change? All right. Thank you for that, I appreciate it. Gasoline burns in an automobile engine. Physical or chemical change? Some mumbles, but I couldn't make out what they were. It's a chemical change. <clears throat> because in much the same way up here, that's why I wrote this generally, rather than ash, let's just simplify this, and I'm going to say we've got carbon. So when you burn things, you have a fuel and oxygen that produce carbon, carbon dioxide, and water vapor. So in this case, the fuel would be gasoline. And we burn gasoline. Understand, in a car, gas, the, the engine is actually controlled many explosions. Those explosions are when the vaporized gas mixes with air and under pressure has a spark added to it that causes it to explode and expand. And the expansion pushes the, you know, in the cylinders, rocks them up and down, turns the camshaft, transmission, the whole bit. So you're taking a fuel and oxygen and you're taking those molecules and those, you're taking those molecules, you're breaking them apart and you're bringing them back together in a different combination. It's a chemical reaction. You can't just run your exhaust through the engine the other way and have gas come out the other side. It doesn't work that way. Okay. okay. A barber cuts your hair. And what is hair? Skin cells. Okay. What are your fingernails? Skin cells. Okay. Do you kind of see the relationship between skin tone and hair color? Because they're related because it's just, you know, different kinds of skin cells. So a barber cuts your hair. Is that a chemical or physical change? You don't hear any hissing, doesn't generate heat, right? It doesn't, okay. Right, you're cutting it, it falls to the ground, but on one side of that scissor cut, the atoms or molecules look exactly like the atoms or molecules on the other side of that scissor cut. It's a physical change. What about when milk sours? It's actually a chemical change. It's a chemical change. When sugar is dissolved in water, Okay. Sugar is nonpolar, but it doesn't really matter. Remember, is dissolving a reaction? Not necessarily, right? When you dissolve salt, it's and even then it's not a reaction. Because you get the sodium and the chlorine and they separate in water when they become aqueous. They separate out. That's why we can have electricity flow through. If we dissolve sugar, it doesn't conduct. Ionics dissolve by separating, but as soon as the water between them is removed, they come back together again. Sugars, they dissolve, but they break down into the individual molecule, but they don't go any farther than that. So when you dissolve sugar in water, what you're doing is putting water molecules between the sugar molecules. But the sugar molecules haven't changed at all, and neither have the water molecules around them. So it's a physical change, not a chemical change. And if we boil out the water, well, you will have sugar left at the bottom of the pot. Boiling out the water is a physical change to the water. That physical change to the water creates a physical change in appearance because now the sugar comes back together as a, as a pure solid, no longer aqueous. So sugar is dissolved in water, that's a physical change. Milk is poured on cereal. Do you have milk, cereal, and when you pour it together, it's something completely different? Or is it milk and cereal together at the same time, but still milk and cereal? It doesn't become a third thing, right? It's a physical change. And an iron nail rusts. It's a chemical change, it's oxidation. So we have iron at the And in oxygen, O2, it's going to produce ferrous oxide, Fe, and oxygen here, FeO. So when those come together, they're going to actually produce another molecule, ferrous oxide, which we call iron rust. Okay. Do you remember when we did the phase diagram on the board? We're not going to reproduce that whole phase diagram. I'll, I'll do some parts of it to kind of refresh your memory. But we had, 
We've talked about water again. Water is a solid, an ice cube, that as it warms, and in, as we go in this direction, and it becomes a liquid, and then over here, becomes a gas. And as we move from this to this direction, as we're moving left to right, we are adding or taking away energy to the water. Adding energy. As we're adding energy, it's changing from a solid to a liquid. And we talked about this as melting, and from, from a liquid to a gas is evaporating. We also said later on we can go in this direction and go from a, a gas to a liquid, which is condensing, and then from a liquid to a solid, which we call freezing, right? But as we're moving from left to right, we're adding energy to the system, adding energy to the water, and then as we move from right to left, we're taking energy out of the water. It's going into the other system around it. We did talk about another case, too, which is going from a solid directly to a gas, which we call sublimation. Okay, but the principle here is that there are different phases, a solid, liquid, and gas phase, and that what elements have solid, liquid, and gas phases? Which elements? Every single one, right? So again, when you ask the question, is carbon dioxide a gas? The answer is, sure, it can be a gas. Is it a gas? Well, at what temperature and pressure? That's the fuller question. Is carbon dioxide a gas at one atmosphere at standard temperature? Yes, it is. It's a gas. At those conditions we're used to operating in, it's about one atmosphere, okay, and it's about 70 or so degrees. At that temperature and at that pressure, that's what we're used to seeing these elements be. And other molecules as well. The molecules that are built from these building blocks, every one of them can be a solid, a liquid, and a gas, but all at particular temperatures and pressures. And that's one of the ways that we physically separate things. We can physically separate things out by applying that knowledge of, let's say I've got two substances mixed together, and one of them freezes at one point, and one of them freezes at a much lower temperature. If I lower the temperature so it's lower than the freezing point of one, but higher than the freezing point of the other, then only one of them is gonna freeze. And then I just take the ice chunks out, and I've separated them out into two different mixtures, or two different elements, two different molecules, two different substances. A good way to say that. Okay. So using these phases, but we also talked about the uniqueness of water, right? Water is a little bit different. As a matter of fact, water is the exception. Water is the exception in this sense. What happens to volume as we move from solid to liquid to gas for water? I generally think in terms of water and then know that everything else is the opposite. So I learn the exception because it's just easier for me and then I apply the inverse to everything else. So as we move from a solid to a liquid, what happens to the volume of our sample of water? If I'll just grab a beaker here. Let's say that I have a beaker. This is a 250 milliliter beaker. I take this 250 milliliter beaker and I fill it up to 100 milliliters of water. And then I take this and I put it in the freezer. I put it right at 100 milliliters, I put it in the freezer, it freezes solid, I bring it back into the room. Where is my level going to be at? It's going to be higher than 100 milliliters, right? For those of you that don't have the automatic dispensers in the door, but you actually still use ice cube trays, you're used to this idea. When you put ice cube trays in the freezer, you don't fill them straight up to the top, make them flush. First of all, because they spill on the way to the freezer, you gotta whip off the kitchen floor. Second, they spill in the freezer, and then you've got all this ice build up at the bottom of the freezer. But third, and probably the significant part in this example is, if you fill the ice cube trays all the way to the top, as they freeze, they're gonna expand and be bigger than the tray they're in. And if they can't expand up, they're gonna break the tray by expanding out. And next time you try to add water to it, they just run through when you're trying to fill a sieve, and it's not good. So what happens for water is, as it freezes, 
the same amount of mass of water. Because if I take this, fill it with 100 milliliters in the room and put it in the freezer, I'm not adding any more water, I'm not taking any water out, I'm not changing the water, I'm doing a physical change to the water. And that physical change to the water causes it to take up a greater volume. The same amount of water frozen takes up more space than the same amount of water in liquid form. Okay. For every other element and every other compound, what happens when it goes from a solid to a liquid or a liquid to a solid? Let's work the same way. Ice takes up more volume and less volume for water. For everything else, the solid state takes up less volume than the liquid. Okay. So, if I have 100 milliliters of water and 100 milliliters of alcohol, I have 100 milliliters of both, and I go put them in the freezer, after they freeze, what would I expect to happen? The volume of the water would be greater than 100 milliliters, but the volume of the alcohol would be less than 100 milliliters. Because for everything other than water, water being the exception, as you go from a solid to a liquid to a gas, it follows a nice linear relationship from a solid to a liquid to a gas. The same amount, not adding any or taking any away, the same amount in solid form, liquid form, and gaseous form, those three phases. For water, it's a little bit different. For water, it's liquid form, solid form. And going the other way, liquid form to gaseous form. Gas takes up a lot more volume than water, but in, for, than liquid. But for water, ice takes up more volume than liquid. That's the exception. Now, we mentioned some of the benefits of that. The particular one being that I mentioned in class and they mentioned in the book is think about what that means when, when water freezes. If I had a container that had multiple substances in it, and this is one of the labs or one of the examples we may do it in here on Friday. Let's say I have a, a graduated cylinder, okay, and I'm going to pour in different substances that they would separate within that tube. I remember Cody liked this one, right? Different <clears throat> things in this tube would separate, and so we'd have one, one substance that would fill at the bottom, and then another substance here in the middle, and a third substance here at the top. And what could we say about those three different substances? Which one is farthest at the bottom? The most or least dense? Most dense. The most amount of matter in the same amount of space. Or another way to think of it is, if I were to look at the volume there, let's say that I had this, this bottom substance and I put in this beaker, for the same volume, I would have more mass, more stuff present. And so we would go to the bottom. And the, those things that are a little less dense, and less dense than that would rise above it. And then we've got here two different separations here, so there must be three substances, the most dense, the middle dense, and the least dense. The F's, the C's, and the A's, right? Hmm. <laughs> now, just because they're more dense doesn't mean they get S. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm trying to make it interesting for me at least. If it's not going to be interesting for you, at least make it interesting for me. Uh, <laughs> if we look at page um, 214. For second edition, that would be page 211, the On Your Owns. Before we do the On Your Owns, the other thing I want you to remember is, okay, when, when water freezes, we've already said that it takes up more space, and so when it takes up more space, it's less dense. When things separate out, the least dense go to the surface. 
So if you remember this, I mentioned about water freezing, specifically pond freezing. When a pond freezes in the winter, and it has, you know, all of our favorites, maybe you have some crayfish in it, some little little minnows swimming around, maybe, you know, those animals that overwinter in the pond. When the water freezes, where does the ice go? <coughs> it goes to the top, right? As it's freezing, it comes to the top. One of the reasons for that is that's usually the barrier since water tends to hold energy. The coldest place is going to be between the interface between the water and the air. That's going to be the coldest place. But then you can see a situation where, let's say that at that point of contact, water's freezing. If it became more dense than liquid, it would sink to the bottom. It would very quickly fill up the pond with frozen water, basically forming sheets of ice that would fall to the bottom, keep stacking up, stacking up, stacking up, until the water, until the pond was completely frozen from bottom to top. Now, what happens to the little guppy or you know whatever is living in the water when everything around it freezes? It dies because it's basically in the middle of an ice cube. And it would die, which means every spring we'd have a thaw, we'd have all this fresh matter falling to the bottom, all this nice organic matter to become fertilizer, but there would be nothing in the pond alive to grow. There would be no, you know, yearling and second year and third year fish. You wouldn't get those fish. Why? Because they were killed off every winter in the solid freeze. But water, because of the property of having a less density, because it expands, when the water on the pond freezes, it doesn't sink to the bottom. It actually stays to the top. It has a sense of buoyancy. So it stays to the top. Why? Because the same amount of water takes up more space, which means it has less density than the liquid water. And because it has less density, it rises to the top. And it stays at the top. It forms a solid layer at the top. And that solid layer at the top actually acts as a blanket to insulate the water below it to keep it warmer than it normally would be. You would think because it's interfacing with ice that it would be colder, but it actually keeps it warmer. The ice protects and keeps the water below it from freezing solid. It keeps those things that are alive in it alive through the winter. The other thing about water that's interesting is called hydrogen bonding. We'll talk about that more later as well. But they mentioned in the book that for all the different compounds that are very similar to H2O, there are other molecules that look like it, geometrically look like it, have the same number of valence shells or valence electrons in their outer shell. And so they react and form molecules that look amazingly like H2O. But H2O is unique because of hydrogen bonding. And so no other molecule behaves the way water does due to hydrogen bonding. And if it weren't for hydrogen bonding and the characteristics that it brings to water, we wouldn't have life as we know it on this planet. Life would be very different. Life might very well be a silicon-based life form rather than a carbon-based life form. And we did the geometries. We talked about how they both form the same geometries and that you can replace, in, in a lot of cases, you can replace one element from a column with another element from the column and make the same same looking molecules with very similar uh, types of reactions, but they're not exactly the same. H2O is a unique because of hydrogen bonding. And that's not the point right now, but just know that. Know that hydrogen bonding and changes in density are where this comes from. Now, module three adds the discussion of density back into the chapter in a few minutes. We'll get to that. Module two, or excuse me, second edition, not module two, second edition you don't have a discussion of density in your chapter. It was in another chapter. We've already covered that, I think, in the very first chapter that we did. So we're going to talk about density again in just a moment as well. So the on your own asks this question. This is 6.2 on 214 for third. This is the comparable one in second edition would be about no, let's see, page 111. Question in third edition says, cubes of frozen rubbing alcohol are put into liquid rubbing alcohol. Will the ice cubes float or sink? Will they float or sink? <coughs> so, we have a container. In that container, we have a liquid. 
And in that liquid, we put a solid of that same liquid, that same compound that's in liquid form, we put a piece of solid. So I've got over here. Here's another liquid. I put a solid of that same compound in the second beaker. Again, each of these have a different compound in them. And they have mostly liquid with a chunk or a cube of solid placed in it. And one of them is rubbing alcohol, and the other one is water. We know that water is the exception. So everything else behaves differently. Now, if you put ice in solid water, in liquid water, if you put ice in water, which of these two pictures would resemble what you have? Which of these looks like ice water to you? This one left. This is what you used to see, right? You're used to seeing ice cubes float on the top. You're used to putting ice in at the machine, it's at the bottom, but when you put it underneath the spigot and you put water into it, the ice cubes float to the top. Why? Because in water, the solid form right here is less dense than the liquid form. Okay? The solid form is less dense than the liquid form for every other substance. The solid form is more dense than the liquid form. So, the question says, if I have cubes of frozen rubbing alcohol and are put into liquid rubbing alcohol, will the cubes float or sink? You expect them to float in water. The opposite is true then for rubbing alcohol. They sink. Why? Because the atoms in that form right there are more dense than the atoms in the liquid form that are around it. Because they're of greater density, they sink to the bottom. Another way to think of it is the water is less dense, so the water is actually trying to rise to the top without creating a vacuum. You can't do that. We covered this one as well before, but for review. It says natural gas companies store most of their natural gas in liquid form rather than in gas form. Even though they must deliver it to their customers as a gas, why do they do this? Why do they transport it as a liquid, even though they've got to give it to you as a gas? Because you have the same number of atoms, excuse me, the same number of molecules of natural gas in the same amount of space for liquid form than you do for gaseous form, right? It's concentrated, think of it that way. It's concentrated when it's in liquid form. It's very, it's much more dense than in gaseous form. So it's spread around. And so they transport it in the form that takes up the least amount of space because in transportation, that's where your cost is. You're paying so much for a volume. You know, you can only put so much volume into a 18-wheeler, let's say. You can pump it full of gas and get you know, gaseous form in vapor form. You could fill it full of the vapor form, or you could fill it full of the liquid form. Which one would contain more molecules of natural gas? The liquid form. So we're going to transport it in liquid form and then distribute it in gaseous form. Why not transport it in solid form? It's too difficult to keep the temperature that low. Now think about it. Let's say you had a plant that could put it in solid form, could get it down to a low enough temperature that you would have your natural gas as natural gas cubes. Okay? Because it's not water, that would be the case where you would have the greatest amount of density. You have the most number of molecules crammed together and squeezed together, the smallest amount of space you know, in those three different forms. But then you have to go put it on some kind of transport mechanism that could not only hold all of that, but would also keep it in that phase. Keep it in solid form. If you put, if you were to take a, a 18 wheeler, one of those gas trucks, and fill it with solid natural gas, seal it nice and tight, what would happen if the cooling system on the truck fit? The truck would explode. You would have a, uh, you would have like a pressure cooker bomb 
the size of an 18 wheeler. Okay, because what's going to happen is as that natural gas in there melts and becomes a liquid, the same amount of atoms are going to need to take up more space. And eventually the pressure inside is going to be so great, it's going to turn the truck into shrapnel. Boom! Blow it all over the place. And so by using pressures and temperatures that are manageable, they can put it in a liquid form, but it's just not safe enough to put it in solid form. Okay. So it's transportable much more reasonably and safely in liquid form. And then they can give it the space to expand, changing its pressure and temperature, convert it into gaseous form, and then send it through the black pipes that come to your home. Let's talk about the kinetic theory of matter. Again, this is review, so a little bit rapid. We talked about the idea that all molecules are in constant motion. They're always in motion. Now, why is it that I can take this marker, which is made up of molecules, Okay. I can place it here on the book, and I can watch it and not see any motion. And yet I'll assert that molecules are always in motion. The motion cancels each other out. Okay. First of all, we talked about solids. And for solids, the motion in solids is not really what you think of as moving as much as it is vibrating. But solids... I'll take these two hands and they represent two different molecules or atoms in solid phase. When they are next to each other, first of all, when the solid's created, those molecules and or atoms come together and form a structure. And when they're in that structure as a solid, they vibrate back and forth. So solids are actually in vibration. But you see, in order to have vibration, even for you to see this, what would it look like if I were to move them together? They're moving relative to the air, but they're not moving relative to each other. See, it kind of looks like I'm riding a horse, right? I figured that's what she was saying. You do the sound effects in it? No. Okay, so <laughs> when they're moving in vibration, they vibrate relative to one another and they're moving like this. Even if we look at it in two dimensions, if I'm moving like this, you can see that as one hand is moving this way, the other hand is moving this way as they vibrate back and forth. That's what's happening. Why solids appear not to move is because there's a vibration and within that solid there's a counter vibration and they're offsetting one another. Now, theoretically, if we had this marker, and I had a way of aligning the vibrations, what would happen? I could align the vibrations, and if I got everything to vibrate in that direction at the same time, what would happen in the marker? Start to slide across the tray, because it's getting pulses moving that way. But you also would get, if they did them all together, they would have to pulse back the other way too, right? But if they go pulse back the other way, it would be forward and backward, and, but it happened so fast that to your eye, it wouldn't actually be moving at all. So the idea is that the molecules and atoms are always in motion, but for solids, they're vibrating, and the vibration counters one another, so there is no net motion. It's not actually moving. The object is not moving, though each individual molecule is moving. That's in the solid phase. When you go to the liquid phase and then to the gaseous phase, the atoms and their molecules are no longer in a direct relationship relative to one another, like in the vibration. When you go to the liquid phase, you have much more free-flowing <coughs> atoms. The atoms and molecules now can actually move about. So in, in the way I present in classes, solids look like this, vibrating. Liquids now, the atoms and molecules move relative to one another. There's a flow taking place. If I have that same beaker, I had it for before, and we're going to actually do this as a lab on Friday as well. If I take that beaker and I put water into it, and I set the beaker and I let it sit still for a while, so that whatever motion is in that beaker is not due to me moving the beaker, but due to the water itself, let me ask you this question. When water has been sitting still long enough for it to stabilize, are the water molecules moving? If I were able to look at one of these beakers of liquid, and I have the beaker sitting stable long enough, and again, I put the ripple on top just to tell you it's a liquid, but there's a liquid in here, and it's been sitting here stable. Let's say we fill it and leave it overnight, come back the next morning, and I say, look over there at the beaker. Is the water moving? 
The answer is yes. But water molecules are moving. We've got water molecules in here that are moving in this direction. They're bouncing off of here. There's water molecules here that are moving here and bouncing off of here. And again, they're moving inside of the beaker, not so much so that they can align and move the beaker. The beaker itself is not moving, but at the molecular level, they are moving relative to each other. They're in constant motion. Even though we don't see the motion, they are in motion. And again, the lab will help clarify that as well. That they're actually always in motion. And the third phase, the gaseous phase, now over here, let's say we've got, let me try to draw this again. Let's see over here, we're dealing with an ice cube, and we have put eyes, not, not you know, fun pants guy, okay? This is just a cube with two <laughs> molecules of water in here stuck together. They're solid, so they're vibrating back and forth. Here we've got water in a beaker, and those molecules of water are moving around. They're bouncing into each other, they're bouncing off the walls, they're being held in, and actually, in some cases, occasionally, there will be a molecule of water that will come up this way and actually break free. What do we call it when a molecule of water in its motion hits the surface and breaks free? It's evaporated. It's now moved into gaseous form. We're talking about the water vapor level right there. And then, in the third phase, in the gaseous phase, are the atoms or molecules moving? Yes, they are. As a matter of fact, if there's motion in the liquid phase, here they are off the charts moving. Here they are just they're bouncing all over the place. And we'll talk about the consequences of that next class.